and that's that's the the moment that I was like god like you know more doctors more people telling me that I'm not an athlete what I can't do like and that's when I sat down in that cafe and I made all the tabs with all the Paralympic sports. I was like, these are definitely sports. Like no one can argue that these are not sports. And the people that do them, they're athletes. This is the highest accolade for someone who is an athlete. And I knew I didn't just want to do the sport as a hobby. I didn't just want to do it on a Saturday and have fun with it. I was like, I need to take this to the highest level. And the highest level is the games. And Hi, I'm Lauren Parsons. And I'm Andy Jackson. And this is the All Well Co podcast. Dive deep with us as leading experts share their unique perspectives on topics such as recovery, sleep, movement, and the latest innovations in the space. Oliver, it's a pleasure to have you on the All Well Co podcast today. So to kick things off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how did we get connected together at All Well Co? Um, well, thank you for having me. It's, um, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, well, I'm, uh, my name's Oliver Lamb Watson and yeah, I'm a, I'm a para fencer for Great Britain. Um, and, uh, I've been doing it now for about seven years. Uh, I went to the Tokyo 2021 Paralympics, um, and brought back two medals, which is an amazing experience. Um, I, I'm now just uh, in the final weeks of preparation before Paris 2024. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's an exciting time. I guess in terms of my background, I, I you know I have a background in architecture, but I kind of gave that up to start wheelchair fencing. And um, and yeah, it's um, and so it's uh, it's an exciting time. <laughs> yeah. And how do we get connected together through our Welco? Oh, so um, my agent Toby from Rocket Sports gave me a call and said, uh, Welco, wanna wanna have you on the podcast from uh, one of one of uh, one of your board members, uh, you know, is, is running the podcast. I thought, yeah, that sounds great. Like, uh, looking forward to it. So, yeah, keen to be here. So, so Oliver, it's a pleasure to meet you. And Oliver Lamb Watson to me sounds like a name that should be in House of Dragon. It does. You should be sounds an actor in House of Dragon. That's what you uh, you definitely House should of be. Lamb. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> House of Lamb. Yeah, it was funny. I was watching it last night. It was quite. It's, it's a crazy no, no show. No spoilers, please. No spoilers. <laughs> I won't say anything. I won't say a word. So, um. Oliver, t- tell us a little bit about your childhood. I'm really interested to understand how your early experiences and your childhood, how that shaped you in terms of who you are today. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I So I, I was born with a disability that affects my left leg. And um, I think being young and disabled can be difficult. Um, you know, I mean, being different when you're younger is always, you know, a tough thing. Everyone wants to kind of be the same and any sort of difference is is really highlighted and um it's only kind of when you grow up uh, a little bit and you you uh, get a bit older that you realize that those differences are what actually makes people quite interesting and unique and 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 special and and I think then people sort of strive for difference um but yeah I think growing up with a disability was always very difficult for me and I I very much shied away from my disability and I I kind of hated the word disability and I you know, yeah. I was almost used to pretend that I didn't have one. And mm. it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was a weird time. I, I remember going to university and telling everyone that I, you know, I was a, I, I was a striker uh, in Chelsea FC and uh, I injured my leg playing football or I was a stunt driver or, you know, I, I would come up with all manner of um, different, <laughs> different um, excuses for it. And it, unfortunately, I was studying architecture. So a six-year course and a couple of years in people realized that it wasn't just an injury um and I think it was at that time I really had to kind of come to terms with actually just telling people yeah you know what I, I have a disability and that was really tough for me um and you know I could never have imagined at the time like trying to hide my disability so much now I'm I'm fencing in a wheelchair and I'm doing things like wheelchair fencing and you know it, it really kind of highlights my difference um I it's think, all about, you know, I mean, two, yeah, two things about what you just said. No, two things about what you said are interesting. One, you're obviously a Chelsea fan. <laughs> do you know what? I'm not. I don't even like sport or football outside of you the don't. sport that I have to do. Just, so you I you think claim like to be, of all the teams, you claim to be a Chelsea player? Wow. <laughs> I think it was our local team growing up. It was quite popular back then. <laughs> um, the second uh, the second thing that was, was fascinating there is that uh, and I never know nowadays what's the right word, but I love the fact that you're just saying the word disability. It, it's yeah. become such a such a thing, and at the end of the day, that's the a, a factual thing. But 
when you were a child, can you give us some significant, you know, some of the significant challenges you faced and then how did you overcome them? Yeah, I mean, I think bullying was one of them. Like, you know, I remember people used to call me a cripple and like all those words, which are a lot less nice than the word disabled. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, making fun of anyone because their disability is difficult. And I think disability is often seen as a bad thing. Uh, and I think still is, you know, I get so many people even now being like, oh, no, like you're too young to be disabled. Oh, I hope it gets better. Oh, my God. And I think the thing is, is that when people on, uh, are constantly trying to tell you, like, to get well and to get better and to fix it, um, it often leaves you feeling, you know, broken um, or, or incomplete. And I think especially as a kid um, spending so much time trying to fix it or, you know, and, and also being told. I, I think one of the biggest challenges is is what you know people see your disability before they see you. I think they see my crutches, especially when I was growing up, and even now before they see me. And I think based on that, they make their their first uh, assumptions on you based on what you can't do and what they think you can't do. You can't go up those stairs. You can't go in here. You can't go. You know, you can't do sport. You can't go to the gym. You can drive. Like you get it so much still. And I'm like, God, you know, really? like, uh, automatic. That really car. surprises yeah. me. Yeah, that really like, um, me. yeah. I get it a lot, like sarcastic comments. Oh, you're gonna drive us home? You're gonna drive them home? It's like, yeah. Well, you know, I drive an automatic, of course. So I don't drive a um, a manual, but you know, I, I think it, that 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 can be so damaging for a lot of people um, when when you assume the negative before you you see the positive or the person even. Yeah, huh. I in doing research on you, I think you said somewhere that initially you you did not like sport or you weren't fond of sport. What was the moment that that changed for you where fitness became a huge part of your life? I wouldn't say that I still like sport that much, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> um, I don't think that's changed too much. I, 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 it did change to become a big part of my life, though. You're right. And, um, you know, I, I was always the one growing up who would get a, a sick note off, uh, you know, off cross country and, and get the doctor's note to write me off games. Um, I... Yeah, I, I I never liked sport as a kid because it, it had a really great way of sort of highlighting uh, my differences with the other kids and kind of showcasing what I couldn't do compared to them. Um, and I think it was after university I went into the doctors and I and I, I spoke to my doctor and he I said, look, like, what are we going to do about my leg? Like, you know, I, I took a bit of a break from seeing him because, you know, at school and stuff like that, I was always in doctors surgeries casting physios I, I i missed a lot of you know important parts of my childhood and i felt as a university i just wanted to to put that all aside for a little bit and just live my life and um so i went back to my doctor and i said like what are we going to do about this and he said look your legs gotten a lot worse whatever you do uh, you're never going to run or walk again normally it's not going to get better and even if you get an, am an amputation and a prosthetic you're never going to be you know an athlete and obviously I had no prior, you know, convictions to being an athlete. Um, I just, I guess I, I wondered why not? Like, mm. you know, um, and, and I, I began this sort of phase of like self-discovery. I gave myself a year. I was like, well, could I go to the gym? Like, could I run? Like, what does that look like on crutches? What does that, you know, there's no real handbook for being young and disabled. So I, I just, I started doing it. And after a couple of weeks, I, you know, I knew that I could, yeah, I could go to the gym. I could, I could even run a little bit. Um, but I wanted to kind of put it to the test. So I, I, I got into these obstacle course races and, um, from there that sort of snowballed a little bit. And, um, eventually I, I basically start, I Googled wheelchair fencing and I, sorry, I Googled Paralympic sports, sorry. And I made a tab for, you know, all of the Paralympic sports. Um, and I was determined to be this like athlete, um, I got really like obsessed with the idea of like proving him wrong. I think in a way, proving to myself that I could do something, even though someone had told me specifically that I couldn't. Um, and, I, and I found wheelchair fencing and I thought, uh, that looks pretty cool. Like I like swords and why not? I'm, I'm getting pretty desperate at this point. I've only got about three months, four months left of my, my gap year. And I and so I, I I threw myself at it and uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. I started training full time. I got coach and the Paralympics were about two years away. And I thought that would be cool. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, see, what did I tell you? Swords. He should be in House of Dragons. You're right. He's got the name. He's got the sport. I mean, you should be in the House of Dragons. Toby, get on it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned the obstacle course races. I was watching your TEDx talk uh, yesterday, and I think you said you did about six of the Spartan races. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I I went through. So I after I I got I started to do I did one. I signed up to one. I wanted to kind of put myself to the test because I knew that I could run. I knew I could lift weights. But I was like, you know, this is this this is you know a bit more of a test. Um, I wanted to see if it was possible. Uh, and so I, I started my first one. I remember I was super nervous before I did it. And it was a, a really scary time because the problem is, is like when you're young, when, like when you, when you approach these kinds of things, you, you have disability mm. or, you know, in any sort of thing where you throw yourself at it. And the idea is that, you know, you, you know, you've got an adversity, whatever it might be, or it seems a bit crazy. People are always like, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're mad. Like, this is like, you've already, you know, you've got, you've already got one leg, uh, you know, that's not working. You're going to break the other leg. You're going to wind up in a wheelchair. You know, you can't do this. People on crutches can't do this kind of stuff. And it's really difficult because, you know, if you then go and do it um, and the, you know, and the outcome is successful, everyone's like, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Incredible guy. So motivational. Mm -hmm. But if the outcome is, you know, what, you know, I mean, maybe doesn't look as successful or isn't what you'd hoped for, it's, it's again back to the old, well, yeah, what an idiot. Like, of course you were not going to do that. What, what was he thinking? And so it's a real, like, bittersweet, um, you know, situation. And so I yeah. was really scared going into my first one. And, uh, uh, you know, long story short, it took me about five hours, but I did it, you know, up walls, ropes and underwater and stuff. I strapped my crutches to my back and I adapted them specifically so that I could carry them through mud and stuff like that. Um, and I, I then became really obsessed with doing these races. And I, each time it felt as though I was like proving the doctor slightly, you know, wrong. And I was being this adaptive athlete. It was only then when I thought, you know, this is, this is going to be my career. I'm going to be making YouTube videos and social uh, content about like, you know, social change and disability mm -hmm. and showing myself doing these races. Um, it was then, so I made, I went to another doctor to, to make sure my heart was okay from going studying architecture full time to be, you know, doing these races and training and fitness. Cause I'd really never done anything to do with fitness or, or, or you know, anything active like this before. And so I wanted to make sure that the old, the ticker was going, uh, going well. And, uh, he was a sports doctor and I remember he was making me do all these, uh, you know, balancing tests and stuff like that. And, and, you know, this is a spoiler cause you watched the Ted talk yesterday, but he basically goes to me like, you know, what sports do you do? And I was like, oh, I do these races on my crutches. And he, he pauses for a second and he's like, well, it's not really a sport, is it? It's just, you know, you mm. get a medal for finishing, like for turning up and you just get a medal for completing it. And that's, that's the, the moment that I was like, God, like, you know, more doctors, more people telling me that I'm not an athlete, what I can't do. Like, and that's when I sat down in that cafe and I made all the tabs with all the Paralympic sports. I was like, these are definitely sports. Like no one can argue that these are not sports. And the people that do them, they're athletes. This is the highest accolade for someone who is an athlete. And I knew I didn't just want to do the sport as a hobby. I didn't just want to do it on a Saturday and have fun with it. I was like, I need to take this to the highest level. And the highest level is the games. And, uh, you know, in order to do that, that's how I can show the world, show these people and it's not about the doctors. Don't get me wrong. I don't like hate doctors. You know, they're just big and <laughs> all people. <laughs> but like, I, I, I guess it, it became more about proving it to myself, to the younger version of myself. And it's a very cliche and fashionable thing to say these days. But to show, you know, young disabled people that listen, like you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting you say that because I feel like we hear this story over and over again. When anyone is striving for greatness, you have the people telling you all along the way you can't do it. But then you do it, and then yeah. like, oh, I knew you could do it, right? Oh, yeah. And so yeah. it's just one of yeah, those things you where you're so. like, come yeah. on, you know? And so I feel like yeah. we just hear that story so often. So that's really interesting about, you know, just your journey and how you've kind of had that too. Whereas, yeah. Was that switch during the races the same time that you finished architecture? So I was going to ask the next question of how did you make that switch from architecture to, to sport? I... I, uh, yeah, so I basically just, uh, I finished my architecture degree, finished my master's. And then I, 
I remember on my hand in day, I literally had a flight. I handed it in at like 11 a.m. My final hand in. And then at like two, I had a flight to the Netherlands to do a race. Um, and I did a whole video about it, actually. It was pretty like, you know, it was pretty tight at some point. We, we cut it pretty close to the edge um, in terms of making the flight. But we did. We spent 24 hours in in in, uh, in um the Netherlands uh, doing this race there. It was, it was incredible. And we came straight back. Um, but I literally just did it. I, I, I don't like to spend too much time feeling it out. Um, mm. Seeing, you know, there's this, there's this whole idea of like, you know, there's a progression and I hate that because it, it's slow. Um, you know, oh, try, try, try the fitness, like, you know, you know, maybe, uh, baby steps and see how you like it first and then and then see if you want to continue it with me it was it was very black and white I finished architecture I went full into these races and everything became about that I became I I, I had a program I you know I was I was all about everything that I did was about this and then creating content in in the uh you know in the run-up to these races how I was training what I was doing filming the races planning the next one I even traveled to Canada and actually did one there um, and then it was similar with architecture. I literally, I said to them, I said, let, let me, I called up every club in London, um, and I, every wheelchair fencing club, or every fencing club in London, rather. I said, can you get me a taster session of wheelchair fencing? They're like half of them said they don't offer it. Half of the other half said they don't, you know, they're closing for summer. And then one said like, yeah, we do offer it. We can do it, but it will be like in a, in a few months. I said, no, 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 it's too late. I need it now. I need to do, can you open up the club? Get me, get me in there, get a sword in my hand, let me try it, and then leave mm. the rest to me. And they did that, which was great of them. And then I said, okay, cool, like I enjoy this. I just needed to make sure that I, it was something I wanted to do. And then the next day I, I got myself a coach. I started training three times a week. I joined a local club. I bought all the most expensive kit. And people, I was like the definition of all the gear and no idea. And everyone was like, oh, what are you doing? You, you just started. <laughs> and it ties me back to that idea of like progression. They're like, just see if you like it first and then get into it more and then take it more seriously. And I said, no, I don't have time for that. Like, you know, the, the Paralympics are two years away. If I want, if I want to go to that, if I want to have any sort of, you know, reach any sort of height, I need, uh, the, these are, t this, these are days, these are hours I can't be just wasting, just trying it out. Like I need to go full in. And so I thought if I had the lightest fencing kit, maybe I could, you know, get a bit less tired and train a bit longer each day or, the, you know, a little bit more breathable, um, you know, whites or a lighter sword, I could just make the most of each session. And I went from never trying it to training full time more than a lot of that other fences overnight, because I knew that like I had to make every moment count and I didn't have time to just try it. So, yeah. so Oliver, let's, because uh, our audience is, is worldwide, but we have a lot of US um, listeners um, who yeah. will be really intrigued about the Paralympics in the UK because over here in the US there's a tremendous amount of support for Paralympians um, and back in the day when I used to live in the UK I remember we started this thing called the National Lottery everybody yes. on a Saturday would go buy their ticket and a lot of that money and funding was used to help Paralympians yeah to the extent that um, Paralympic sport is super competitive in the UK it's not yes. like you're one of two people there are hundreds of people who are out there are doing it. So you competed in your first World Cup six months after starting wheelchair fencing. That yes. seems incredibly intense. What was that experience like? How did you manage to do that, knowing there's such competition in the UK for this? Yeah, so we, we are, yeah, we are actually funded by the National Lottery and it's great. And and, and there was a bit of competition. It is still a, it is still a niche sport, I'll be honest with you. So I think sports are funded well, but, uh, you know, there were, there were other people doing wheelchair fencing and they you know, and it's, the sport is growing well, but it, it's a really good question because there were a lot of people there that have been doing it for like, I think nine years earlier than me. And like wow. some people have been trying for London at the time. And this was the you know, 2017. So it was about five years after that. And so like, you know, I, I was competing against people that had been doing this for years back you know when i didn't even know what sport was uh, when i was I, the paralympics wasn't even on my radar and so i knew that like it's impossible for me to control how good they are um but the only thing that i can control is how good i get and i can't 
I can't make it so that I'm the best. But what I can do is I can make it so that I'm the best I could be within the amount of time that I have. Um, and I just focused on that. I, every day I, I trained, every day I focused on, you know, how can I be the best I can be? And that's such a cliche thing, but, um, you know, I, I didn't focus. Yeah, they were beating me every day and like they were better than me. But I was like, again, I can't control how, how good they are. I can control how good I am. Uh, and make sure that I'm squeezing, you know, each moment out of the week, uh, every week. And so I did that and I, I kept going, I kept going. It was, it was between me and two others. One guy was a bit older than me who'd been fencing for about seven or eight years at the time. Uh, another guy who was a bit younger than me who'd been fencing for about nine years at the time. And uh, and we were kind of going back and forth on like who would be the teammate for who would be the, the last person on the team for Tokyo. And, um, and yeah, you know, I was very fortunate in that I was, I was picked, the coaches saw something in me and they, you know, I trained hard and I, and I applied myself. Um, I worked hard and smart um, and I, I, I did the best I could. And, you know, there, there, there's an alternate universe where my best wasn't enough and someone else made it to Tokyo and I didn't. Um, but where, where I was, you know, it's out of my control. How good other people get, like I said. So it was, um, it was a, yeah, it's, it's not something I tried to think about too much, other people. So let's, uh, let's, let's zoom forward then. So you went with Great Britain team to Tokyo. You won a silver and bronze medal, which is an incredible yes. achievement. Um, I think a lot of people won't understand about fencing that there are different, um, let's say, genres of it. There's, Epi, I think, foil. Can you just yeah. explain what you won the silver, the bronze. Just give people a bit of education about fencing. So there are three different weapons within fencing. Um, the first being foil. Uh, and that, uh, basically, the differences between these three weapons, they look slightly different. Um, there's foil, epi, saber. Um, the difference is mainly in terms of the weapon and how you hit, in terms of saber you can slash people it's like a bit more of a cavalry weapon it's a bit more swashbuckling like a pirate sword um <laughs> you can hit people with the side of the sword whereas epee and foil um they're more how you think of like traditional french fencing so mm. you know you stand uh, sideways and you hit the point and you have to hit them you know with a lunge and a, well not necessarily with a lunge but with, with with the end of the sword um the other difference is in the target area so with epee you can hit anywhere on the body including the mask, the hands, anywhere. Um, in wheelchair, it's slightly different. It's just above the waist because we don't put the legs as targets. Yeah. Um, foil is only on the torso. The idea of that is that it's supposed to be like a killing blow. So if you get hit in the hand, you might not die, but you have to hit in foil only on the torso. So you wear a metal jacket that's only uh, on, on your body. It doesn't cover the arms so that it only registers a point if you hit on the torso. Um, and that includes the back as well. Um, and then the saber, which again is everywhere above the waist and you can hit with any part of the blade. Um, and then the last thing is that foil and saber, they're weapons of convention, we call it. So uh, basically you can say convention or priority. Um, basically simplified, what that means is that you need to start the attack. Um, I heard a really funny way of uh, saying it. It's like, it's like basketball. In order to score the point, you need to have the ball. Um, and you think of the ball as like the priority is like if I start the attack, it's my turn. I've got the ball. I then if I stop or you 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 defend my attack, then you get the ball and it's your turn to attack now. Hmm. So um, so you have to have that sort of priority. Um, in, and and then we have an, a referee who adjudicates that. That's really interesting. So you went to Tokyo, you win a silver and a bronze. You're yeah. there and they put that medal around your neck. How, yeah. Tell us how that felt. I turned to my, my teammate and I said, do we get to keep these? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I swear. Like those really big weird. fake checks. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I thought they were like a fake one. Not fake one. I thought they were like a, a, a um, presentation one that we give mm. back afterwards and we take something else. And you just literally get to keep it. This incredible medal. Like, wow. Like if you've ever been hands-on with an olympic or a paralympic medal they are like different they're so heavy so beautifully like crafted they're they're insane um 
and yeah i mean they're, they're the pinnacle um it was wild and uh it just felt really surreal um and a lot had gone into that we trained uh the three of us over covid uh so hard um, and we won this in the team event so it really felt special winning alongside your teammates and your and and and, and that my teammates i'm very fortunate that you know they are very close friends of mine there and, and so you know to, to win with your best mates uh, at the Paralympics, after you'd been through so much, it just felt really like it was a lot of, there was a lot of emotion uh, and it felt very special. Um, and it definitely is, a, is a, it's a moment and a time that, you know, and the medals are great, don't get me wrong, but it's not so much about the medals. And I don't think I like, I would say that I'm just someone who just likes to win medals because I like gold medals. So the camaraderie, the you love the it's, camaraderie. It, it's, it's the camaraderie, it's the story, it's the, it's the punctuation at the end of the chapter that started with me saying, well, what if I could be an athlete? So that for me is what made it special. And I see life as, as a story sometimes. And, and, uh, and that I thought would be a really great end to the story. Um, and it was, it was amazing. So you're known as an advocate for disability inclusivity. So how do you leverage your platform to you know, overcome the stigmas and encourage positive change? What, what are you doing? I was always one growing up, like I never, I never liked, I always struggled with the sort of like logistics of things and paperwork and, and, um, you know, articulating things. I was much better at just showing you doing things. And so like, for me, like when it came down to like, how do I want to try and change the face of disability for me? The, the only way that I could imagine was by doing it, being the change you want to see, um, you know, rather than telling people, people with disabilities can do sport. I'm going to do sport. I'm going to show you. I'm going to document the journey and I'm going to show you um, rather than saying, well, you know, uh, I remember I was at the track once and um, I was running and uh, these these uh, these two girls uh, were running next to me. I think it was a Saturday morning after a Friday night and they were like, God, I feel awful. I'm almost, uh, he's almost faster than me today as they, they, they ran past me. And I was like, God, can you imagine if that was any other sort of like minority group that you would say, God, I feel like, I feel like such crap that even he's almost faster than me or she's almost, or they, or whatever it might oh, be, yeah. or for whatever reason, it's horrid. Um, and so rather than saying, hey, guys, wait up, that's really incorrect. Uh, you know, you can't say that about disabled people. Some disabled people can run really fast. I was like, I I'm just going to run faster than you. So I, I, I overtook them about three times to the point at which they were like, oh, my God. Like I heard one of them say, like, oh, God, now he's just showing off. Aren't, like, now, now I feel even worse. He's just showing off now. And again, it just shows the attitude of like, well, I it's hard to change people's attitude by telling people things. I would much rather show you because I guarantee yeah. they're not going to get on the track again with another person with a disability and say, Oh, I feel, I feel so awful today. Even he's going to, or they, gonna, they're going to be faster than me because they've been overtaken by someone on crutches several times now. Um, similarly to like, if I tell people, Oh, you know, I skateboard on crutches. I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to show you. And I love to see the faces of people as I skateboard past them on my crutches like it's remapping their brains they're like their eyes are open they're like their mouths are uh like dropped and they're just like oh my god like you can see it like reworking their brain like god I, what's happening here like what am I seeing and it, I, I think that's so much more powerful and they say like what a picture is worth a thousand words kind of thing yeah. um and I think just showing and doing and being the change you want to see I think is so important and a lot of it also is about documenting the journey because I think so much when I was younger, I'd see these Paralympians on TV and stuff like that. And there was this real gap between like where I am with a young, as a young disabled person, these like heroes on TV and the screen and like, how do I get there? Um, there was no real in between. Um, and so like, I, I really try now to be active on social media and show people the journeys of the day in, the day out, the highs, the lows, um, and show people the, the process and just say like, look, this is how I did it. Like you can do it too. I was never sporty. I didn't even like sport, but I did it because it was, it meant something to me. So you can do it as well if you want that or not necessarily sport, but whatever it is that you want to do. Um, 
and I think showing that is important, but also showing all of it. Because the problem also with social media is that you only see what people want you to see. Mm. So you see the PBs and the, the best days and when they're looking amazing and they're driving around in brilliant cars and lovely flats and, you know, lovely nights out. But you don't see the the hundred times you fall off a box jump trying to make that PB or the times yeah. that you just feel like crap. and You're just like, I feel I want to quit today. I just don't feel good. And so I try to show those, even though it feels a bit uncomfortable, um, because I think it's important to show people that athletes are not these like crazy people that always are motivated and love sport and they're just gifted. It's like, actually, we're just, we're, we're all just people and we're all just striving to different things. And, and this is just what I've chosen to do. And if you wanted that, you could do that as well, is yeah. what is my main thing that I try to show people. Yeah. I was, as I was watching your TED talk yesterday, your sign off was really powerful, right? Watch me. And that just, yeah, yeah. it hit me, right? Like yeah. I have tears of like, oh my yeah. gosh, yes, just watch me. So I think, you know, be the change. That's always the most powerful thing you can possibly do. Is show it. Yeah, do it's it. funny. Just I remember it. my, my mum said to me after the, I did that TED talk, after I went to Paris, because I said like, you know, my doctor said I'd never be an athlete. Now I'm, I want to go to Tokyo uh, and be, a, you know, because I, I did the, 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 the TED talk before I went to Tokyo. And I remember my, I said like, watch me. Uh, I'm going to go to Tokyo, watch me. And I remember my mom said to me after, she was like, I, I like, but you've now gone to Tokyo and it's like, and you, cause you said, watch me and, and, and now you've done it. I was like, yeah, that was the point. And I did it. Like, I wasn't like, kidding. Yeah. Because, and she was, I was like, that was the whole point of it, mom. Like you missed the point massively. But yeah, exactly. So it, I, I think those kinds of things are fun where I kind of called myself out on it before I even did it. I said, Let, let's like, look, I, I, I'll, I'll back myself to do this. This is scary. I'll say I'm going to do it. If I say I'm going to do it, I'll do it. So yeah, mm. watch me. And I, and I did it, which was cool. Yeah, I love that. So <laughs> Paris is approaching quickly for you. And I'm really keen to understand how your training regimen has evolved to where it is now. And kind of what do you focus on from here on out in preparation for the games? Yeah, so the, uh, my training's changed a lot since Tokyo. And now it's, it's you know, it's been a we go through phases of like, you know, after Tokyo, it was about like learning and then it was about like understanding uh, what I'm doing. And then can I do it? Like, can I do it in a competitive scenario? Now, three weeks out, we fly out. It's just about refining. I, I, I'm not going to get that much. Uh, I'm not going to learn anything new in the next three weeks. I'm not going to be able to, uh, you know, develop new tactics in the, in the next three weeks. Uh, it, you know, now is about understanding this is the the peak form that I'm going to be in. Uh, I just need to refine that now. Can I do it a hundred times? Can I do it a hundred times under pressure? Can I do it when I'm sick, when I'm sweaty, when I'm hot, when I've done it already for the last four days? Can I do it again? And can I do it perfectly? And can I do it gold medal standard after we've been doing it six days in a row? You know, can I do it in someone else's chair? Can I do it with someone else's sword? Can I do it when I haven't eaten, when I haven't slept? Can I just refine it to the point whereby I can just, you know, make sure that this is this is my final form and it's extremely robust. Um, and so it's actually, yeah, it, it, it's horrible. Um, the training recently is, is, <laughs> is gross, <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it, it's actually good because at the same time, there's less mental pressure. Um, okay because I don't feel like I'm like not mental pressure. There's a lot of mental pressure because we, we're, we're doing a lot of like psychological pressure sessions. But what I mean is there's less learning, which can be more mentally fatiguing sometimes. Mm. How strict are you on nutrition, sleep? I mean, is this just, is your whole day regimented? I, I am strict because I like to be strict. I, 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 I never, I'm never... <laughs> My 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 sleep is strict because I sleep badly because of my leg because I have like a lot of chronic pain. So I choose to be very strict, but it's not because I'm forced to be strict. And mm. it's not a strictness for me. It's just what I like to do. So I wouldn't say I was strict. I just to other people it would seem really like strict and weird. But like I you know I I eat beforehand. I, I'm really good with my sleep hygiene in terms of like I like wind down. I I use like these nasal strips to like help me breathe better. And I like don't use my phone and I turn the lights down. I use these blue light glasses. And Bit so, of a biohacker, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it seems really long, but I just, it helps me get the most out. I also am a bit older than some of the other athletes. And I uh, and so for me, sleep is like, can I maximize that as much as possible? Because so I, I, I like to do that kind of stuff. 
Mm. When it comes to diet, it's so funny. Like a lot of people ask me about diet and my, my ethos, oh, you know, you must be really strict. We're not one of the weighed sports. So like, it's not like rowing or boxing where like I have to weigh what I eat and, and meet a weight. Um, but I, I maintain a consistent weight and physique most, you know, mostly around, all year round pretty much. And when it comes to diet, my biggest thing is I say, I always, I, uh, I eat whatever I want to eat within reason yeah um yeah i don't have a diet that i follow i don't you know punish myself this i'm not strict and eating only rice and chicken um i just eat whatever i want to eat within reason and yeah. I, and if i'm able to be reasonable about that, i know my body well by now and i've tried a lot of different things and styles and, and there are things that i really like that like i really love intermittent fasting for example i think it, it works really well with my body um other people are like, you know, they like keto diets for, fen you know, whatever it is they do. I, I can't do that because I just end up, if I don't eat carbs, because I, because I work quite hard in terms of like my muscle mass ends up just, uh, I sweat it out. Mm. So my sweat is like yellow and it smells like ammonia because it's all the amino acids coming out because I've got no carbs in my system. So it just doesn't like keto does not work for me, but my teammate loves it. Um, and so, yeah, it's just about finding really what works for you. Mm hmm yeah so Paris is coming up yeah what are you what are you visualizing I mean I of course when people say what are your goals is to win right but it feels yeah. like it's more in depth because you've talked about social media and and your journey and what this means in a bigger way so if you had to visualize what your goals are o overall for Paris what does everything look like I have one goal and that's to make myself and my mum proud um that's it I love it. I don't really care. Like, you know, it comes from that. I don't like to set outcome goals. Um, win a gold. Yeah, of course. Everyone wants to win gold. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. If I say I want I, I to I wanna win, I want to do, yeah, everyone wants to win. Like, no one wants to go there. I mean, some people just go and take part. But I think that if you ask them if they want to win, of course they want to win. They just lost sight of the possibility of it actually happening. Mm. I want to go there. I want to, uh, you know, uh, I want to make my late mother proud. I want to make myself proud. And in order to do that, I know that I will have to do my best, make sure that I leave nothing uh, on the table. I make sure that I, I push every, you know, push, give it absolutely every part of myself, um, leave with no regrets and, uh, and give it my absolute best because if I if I give it my best and I don't you know and I, and I turn around like I look back on Tokyo we didn't win we came second right we lost in the final to China but I, I don't have any animosity towards that fight because like we just lost and like they were better than us it's not because we like fans like crap or we just like weren't good enough or etc cetera, etc cetera. well we could have trained harder we just they were just better than us on the day and like we gave it our best shot and if I can go there to Paris and say I gave it my best shot because the problem with setting outcome goals is like it's it's based on the idea that like hard work pays off and it like doesn't always um and it's like really ugly the truth of it like everyone wants to you know everyone wants to think that like hard work pays off and if you have a goal and you work hard enough towards it you'll reach it which is unfortunately not the case i know so many athletes who have and and, and you know when you do professional sport you get to meet these people because you don't hear about them if you if if, if you're just a spectator because their names don't become well known, but they work just as hard. They they sacrifice just as much. They want it just as badly. They're in great shape. They push it hard every single day. They sacrifice their you know their time, their effort, their love, whatever it might be, blood, sweat, and tears, and they don't make it. But why? Am I working harder than them? No. Uh, it's just sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, caveat to that is that hard work doesn't always pay off but it might and i think that is really exciting because when nothing's for sure anything can happen and the only way you're going to know is by doing it and finding out yourself not by someone telling you well you can't be an athlete oh you couldn't do that because you're on crutches or you have a disability so i try to set goals based on like actually something that i can be holistically proud of and that i can actually uh you know have an impact on which is can i make sure that i'm you know, in the best shape of my life going there. Yes. Can I make sure I do my best and control the controllables? Yeah. Whatever comes from it, comes from it. 
I would love to come back with a medal, don't get me wrong. They look awesome. Will I be gutted if I don't? Of course. Uh, but will I be more gutted if I win them? I've won medals before and I think I didn't fence well here. Like, I didn't like yeah. it means nothing. Yeah. I take it off as soon as I get off the podium and I put it in my pocket and I I don't really care about it and it doesn't mean anything. I've also lost fights before where I thought, you know what, I I, I went down fighting and I, I uh, I'm proud of that. Yeah. And I leave that those those are the ones that I leave with a bigger smile on my face than winning a medal. Yeah. I love the the saying of but it might, right? We've been using this saying recently to parallel in sales that yeah. if you don't ask, it's a no anyways, right? So you might as well yeah. ask. You might as well do it and get out there and, and, and see see what happens. So I love it. I'm a big advocate of doing things. I, I think I don't like to talk about it or plan it. I think just make a mark, do it. At least then you know if it was for you, if it wasn't for you, if you can make it better, how to make it better. I think just doing is so, so much more productive than, you know, I, they, they say that thing is what's perfection is the enemy of good. And I'd rather make, do a do hundred things that are okay. And I learn from them and I, I go on to the next one or, you know, the hundred things that are good than do one perfect thing. Cause you know, it's not going to be perfect at the end of the day because nothing's perfect mm -hmm. and you'll spend ages trying to make it perfect, but it won't be. Uh, and, you you know, you haven't learned from those other 99 times that you tried it and failed. So, Oliver, one of the fascinating things about sport is the camaraderie and it is yeah. after the event is over. But one of the most fascinating things is rivalry. Yes. Is there another athlete that you're going to meet in Olympics? You don't need to name them, but is there another yeah. athlete you're going, I just really want to beat them. Have you got a rival? Is there a rival in fencing that you just go, oh, I, I just, I'm so determined to beat them? Um, yes and no. Like, there's one guy that I quite like. I, I, I've been in once for a medal, which is quite good. Quite enjoyed that. Uh, I like to beat the home nation people in, they, in their, in their <laughs> yeah. So yeah. being well, especially in fencing, class. especially in fencing, that's, yeah, uh, that's being a big deal in France. At fencing would be epic. Being the Italians in Italy is also great. Like, like in my opinion, I, I'm a bit like uh, I feel like a bit like Achilles. You know, I, you know, I like to, I like an audience. Like, I don't see that. Like, I think what's the point in winning? In as he says to Hector, he's like, "There's no, I'm not going to kill you now. When there's no one here to see you fall." Like, I love that. I think, I think the the hype that it brings, the people, the crowd. Like, yeah. I want the crowd to cheer for you. I want you to be on great form. I want you to want to win in front of the, your home nation. And I and I want to and I want to come in here with my team, you know, or individually, and, and we're going to take that because, like, this is ours. And I like and I, I love that, um, you know, just going there and just just making, you know, this piece doesn't matter where it is. Doesn't matter, you know, if we're in Italy, we're in France, we're in Paris for the Paralympics you know, at the home nation games, like this is our piece, like this is ours and we're going to awesome. take it and we're going to show you that it's ours. Um, and I think that's really special. So Oliver, um, there's going to be a lot of young people here, whether they're aspiring Paralympians, uh, people with disabilities, people yeah. who just, they're going to listen to this and they're going to go, oh, I'd like to compete in the Olympics. What's a couple of bits of advice you'd give them? Uh... Just do it. Like it, it's, it, you know, it's not as hard as it sounds. I mean, it's definitely really hard, but like, it sounds so stupid and so simple. Saying just do it. Like, yeah, well, like, well, pick a sport, pick a sport, find out like what you want to do, try it, commit to it, do it every day, like become obsessed with it. Let it, you know, find what you love and let it kill you. Like, just, just, just do it every day. If you want to go, if that's your goal, go to the Olympics. Like then just find something that, I mean, okay, so if I was right now starting, I said, I want to go to the Olympics in LA. I'd, I'd, I'd go and I'd find whatever sport there was. I'd see, I, I'd, I'd find the one that I thought that I could be the best at the quickest. And that would involve obviously like maybe not something that people have been doing for ages, like shooting or something like that. Something maybe not like, you know, physically that I'm, I'm adapted to, like maybe not high jump because I'm like five foot nine something that I felt like I could be good at, you know, quickly, what would that be? I don't know. And then I'd think, could I train that? Like, what about canoeing? Okay. I live nowhere near any water. So like, I can't canoe and train all the time. Cause yeah, maybe I'd be really good at canoeing, but if I can't train every day, then there's no point. Okay. 
So then what about high jump? Okay, yeah, there's a high jump, a ping pong. There's a ping pong club like right next door to me. Amazing. Okay, I can start there. I can start training. Like find the sport, find something that's appropriate. And this is, by the way, this is if your goal is to purely go to the Olympics, then I would start, I'll go buy the best ping pong racket. I would do loads of research into what's the best ping pong. What do they call it? A paddle. I, <laughs> I would just, I would just live and breathe ping pong. For the next four years, I would find my local club. I would find other people. I would play with people. I would tilt the board in half and I would smash balls against it. Um, and I would just do it every day until I would get in touch with my local federation and I would start doing competitions at a national level. And then I would try to get selected for the, G for the GB or whatever team that you were at. And then I would try and compete internationally. And then I would try and learn more and more. I just and keep growing it until I made it to LA or I didn't. That, that's what I would do, and that yeah. would be if you've got if you you know got a passion for a, a particular sport, then do that. But that's what I would do. That's what I did with fencing. I think that's great advice. That's great advice. Well, this has been fascinating for me, and um, one of the key things about our podcast is it's all about kindness and it's helping other people. So, is there someone that you'd like to acknowledge or give a shout out to? Someone who particularly inspired you through your journey that you just like to show kindness to and and give them a shout out. Um. Yeah, my my um, I think it was my you know my I, I've been helped by a lot of people, but I mean what and the one that's a nice story for the podcast is uh, I remember my my best mate from school who he uh, he knew me before I had my disability and he knew me then when I went on crutches for the first time and then we you know we, we've obviously we've been best friends ever since and I remember he was the first person I said to to him when I started wheelchair fencing. I said, uh, you know, I want to take this. I want to go to the games. He was the first person I did uh, did my Spartan race with as well. And he wrote my program when I went to my doctor. He's a, he, he's into fitness. And he, he was a qualified PT. After my doctor said, you'll never be an athlete. He wrote my fitness program. I followed it. I got in shape. He did my first race with me. Um, and then he, he was the first person I said, hey, like, I want to go to the games here. And he said, cool, let's do it. Like, this sounds like a great idea. Um, and so I guess, yeah, he's the person that's been there for, since, you know, since day one, Please um, give, his, give his name a shout out. Yeah. And his name's Josh Ritchie. So yeah, big, big shout out to Josh. Um, he's been there since day one and definitely when people say I couldn't have done it without you, I think that's definitely quite a, a true statement in this case. Love it. Well, this has just Thank been you. absolutely fascinating. And obviously we will be cheering you along. Um, what are the actual dates of your competition? Yeah, so I'm fencing uh, from the 4th till the 8th. 4th August. to 8th of September. Of August. Yeah. No, September, sorry. September, I was going to say I thought it was September. 4th to 8th of September. It already is August. I'm going to say it's already. Yeah. It already I'm is August. Tomorrow, shit. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah, why am I doing this? Well, uh, good luck. We'll be cheering you along. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing the results. And thank you very much for joining us here. Thank you so much, guys. It's great to be here. Just quickly before you sign off, don't forget to visit network.allwellco.com and join our professional network. You'll get to enjoy exclusive benefits from brands we love and have access to a community where learning and professional development are always at the forefront of everything we do.